can we begin to understand the moral imperative of bringing those that are responsible to justice. Of course, crimes against humanity have been an integral part of the way in which the Islamic Republic has ruled for the past 30 years. The only difference is that the rapes and tortures and murders are now out in the open for everyone to see. And many people who once upon a time thought that it is possible somehow to reform the system or who simply could not believe that those who speak in the name of God and Islam and everything that is sacred were capable of committing such abominations against their own brothers and sisters now realize that not only is it possible, but that this is the instrument by which these rulers stay in power. When we speak about crimes against humanity, we have to understand that it is not merely a political slogan. Crimes against humanity in international law emerged after the Second World War in the charter of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg that prosecuted the top 22 Nazi leaders. In brief, crimes against humanity refers to widespread or systematic human rights abuses, such as murder, such as torture, such as rape, such as unlawful imprisonment, such as persecuting people solely because of their political or religious beliefs. And the situation in Iran is surely an exemplary instance of crimes against humanity on all counts. In short, crimes against humanity describes a situation where human rights violations are not merely the evil deeds of a few bad policemen or prison officials, but where terrorizing people is an integral part of the policy of the state and how it exercises power. Those who are responsible for crimes against humanity obviously include those cowards who in the prisons have raped and tortured and murdered. But those who are most responsible are those that give the orders for such crimes to be committed, who instigate such crimes through incitement to hatred, or who simply tolerate and acquiesce in such conduct. Leaders, whether they are heads of state, supreme leaders, ministers, or other public officials, those who order, instigate, or tolerate these crimes are no longer leaders, they are simply criminals. And this is a reality which we have fought very long and hard to impress upon the policy makers and decision makers in the international community, who more often than not will only pursue their narrow self-interest, oblivious to fundamental precepts of human rights. Bringing the leaders of the Islamic Republic to justice will be a long and tortuous process. We should have no illusions that chanting slogans is going to bring us to that reality. The beginning of the process is for the truth to become apparent to all peoples, especially within Iran. 21 years after the mass murder of some four to 5,000 leftist political prisoners in Iran, the Islamic Republic still does not recognize that such an event ever took place. Just a few months ago in Khawaran, a bulldozer dug up the unmarked graves so that there is not a single trace of this mass murder. Why do I mention this? Because the fact that no one was ever brought to justice for that mass murder explains why we are witnessing the crimes that we are witnessing today in Iran. Because not only is there a culture of impunity, rather human rights violations are the path to promotion.
in the Islamic Republic? What happened to those that were responsible for the mass execution of 5,000 innocent people in 1988? One of the members of the Death Commission, Esmail Shushtari, became the Minister of Justice between 1989 and 2005. Another, Mustafa Pur Mohammadi, was the Minister of Interior in President Ahmadinejad's first cabinet, and today I understand he occupies also a senior position. What happened to Mr. Nayeri, who was also a member of the Death Commission? He today is the Deputy Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Iran. What can one expect of a government where crimes against humanity is the path to promotion? And I say this point not merely because I understand that all of us feel moral outrage that such impunity has existed, but in order to draw a connection between impunity and future crimes, we cannot understand change in Iran simply through the prism of replacing one group of power-hungry tyrants with yet another group of power-hungry tyrants, whether we call it an Islamic republic, a secular republic, a monarchy, or whatever system of government we may have. The point is that we have to fundamentally change the rules of power and legitimacy. Power is not a license to kill. Power is a responsibility that is owed by leaders to ensure the rights of each and every Iranian citizen. And until... And until those that trample human rights under, under their feet with such violence are not brought to justice, then we will never have the future that we all want to build. We will never have a culture in Iran which is based on the dignity of all human beings. Getting to this stage is going to be a very difficult task. In the uh, Iran Human Rights Documentation Center that some colleagues and I established some five years ago, we've prepared a number of um, detailed investigative reports that um, have set forth in considerable detail the various episodes of crimes against humanity that have been committed in Iran. And you can visit the website of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center to read some of those reports. The most recent of which is the most comprehensive ever report detailing what happened in 1988 and who was responsible. And if you look at that report, you will see that the perpetrators are a who's who of all the leaders that today are exercising power in Iran. The documentation of these crimes is important because while these, power may be, these individuals may be in power today, they may not be in power tomorrow. That's one of the lessons I learned as a UN war crimes prosecutor at The Hague, when the president of Yugoslavia, Slobodan Milosevic, who was responsible for ethnic cleansing, was untouchable. And all the Western policymakers told us that you are a fool for believing that he will ever be brought to justice because he is in power and we need to negotiate with him. We need to be realistic. And some years later, in a velvet revolution led by the students of Serbia, Slobodan Milosevic was overthrown, and a year later, he was being prosecuted at The Hague. We need to ensure that these crimes are documented in a credible way, to ensure that until the time comes when we can prosecute these people, whether at The Hague or preferably before the courts of Iran itself in a democratic state, that these people are not allowed to step foot outside of Iran, that they're not allowed to have bank accounts and investments and to move about freely.